Running a library is not an easy thing to do. You'd be surprised at the number of people who think that all librarians do is sit around and read the whole day. They have no concepts of all the duties that come with being a librarian. In just one day, my mother will teach a class for senior citizens on how to use the computer, help four different families find the graves of their loved ones, register a thousand new books into the system, reorder all the books that have been returned, and hold a story time session for the children. The list goes on and on. The point of me telling you this is for you to understand that it takes a person with a degree and years of experience to run a library, and I am not that person. My mom has run our small town's library for over 20 years. She's damn good at what she does, and that's the only reason that town still has a library. Unfortunately, this meant that it was difficult to replace her, even for a short amount of time when she fell down the basement stairs and broke her leg. I should have suspected something was up when she called me home. I'm a freelance writer, so it's not difficult for me to come back to rural Minnesota at a moment's notice. You'll understand, however, that I don't do it very often. I rarely have any shred of desire to return to my hometown. I need you to watch over the library for me until I can go back to work. When my mom said that, it wasn't a request so much as an order. It was easy to tell from the set look in her eyes that she had already mentally decided I would be taking over for her, regardless of any request of mine. As the librarian's daughter, I knew better than anyone how difficult her job is. I blanched when she asked me and said, Mom, there's no way. I don't know how to register books. I don't even know how to use a system. My mom waved her hand dismissively. It's not a problem. You won't have to register any books. You can just check them out, which you've done before. Another librarian from Rock County will be coming once a week to register any new books and fix anything you might have screwed up. I wanted to scowl at that, but I held back, mostly because it was true. For the most part, I need you to deal with the patrons. Help them find books, help them with research, keep the computers up and running. You do realize you're asking me to do the impossible, right? I deadpanned. My mom sighed. Look, I know this isn't ideal, but it's only for a few weeks until my leg is better. I just need you to keep things afloat. You know if there was anyone qualified to do this, I'd ask them. As it is, you're the closest to a qualified librarian this town has aside from me. You've grown up with the library, and you know the basics of how it works. You can do this. I gave my mom a skeptical look, but she just returned it with an encouraging smile. I sighed as she began to give me a rundown on my duties as her stand-in. There were so many details I actually had to take notes. By the fourth or fifth page, I was convinced that she was setting me up for failure. Just do your best. You'll be fine, she said. Yeah. Sure. The first day at the library was utter and complete hell, mixed in with some chaos and a healthy dose of self-loathing. I followed my mom's instructions to the letter, but even that was a paltry comfort. Make sure you have time in the morning for story time. It starts promptly at 9 a.m. Usually I love kids, but not when I'm the one who has to try to keep them in line, and they never stop talking. It took me 15 minutes to get to the fourth page of this stupid picture book I picked out. That's something about a dumb jellyfish that lost his glasses. Jellyfish don't even need glasses, you little shits. Try to run a virus scan on each computer before noon. If one computer goes down, the rest are sure to follow. Trust me. Of course, it would be my luck that the computers would all crash on my first day. I called the resident IT guy, a man from across the county, who proved to be distinctly unhelpful. I can probably get him to fix them later this week, he said. Oh, perfect. Computerless for a week. I don't remember what exactly I said to him, but 
Apparently my threats were frightening enough to get him in within the hour. He carefully avoided me as he fixed the computers. Some patrons might need help with genealogy research. Just do the best you can. Even with the websites my mom provided, it was near impossible to find these people. My great-great-grandmother's name was Ethel. Can you find her for me? I can try. What's her last name? Oh, I'm not sure, but I know she lived in a red house. I see. Any other information? She was a witch. I'm trying to find her spellbook. Right. Some kids will probably be coming in to find books for school. They have a reading program in school, and they have to earn a certain number of points in a semester by reading books in their reading level. Make sure to get them books appropriate for both their age and reading level. What do you mean my son shouldn't read a clockwork orange? Screamed the soccer mom, her long manicured nails tapping on the library desk. Her eight-year-old son stood a little ways away, browsing the sports books. It's just not age appropriate, ma'am. I'll have you know my son is damn smart, and he can read whatever he wants. Ma'am, about half of this book is about rape, and the other half is about murder, I said, losing patience. What? She shrieked, throwing the book down on the counter in disgust. Why on earth would the school recommend such filth? And why do you offer it here? Really, I expect more from a public institution like this. So, like I said... That first day was exceptionally long and brutal. Days after weren't much better. There were a few odd instructions that my mom had given me before sending me on my doomed mission. They were so strange, in fact, that I asked the hospital if they'd check my mom for a concussion. Because she was obviously talking nonsense. She had to be. Every night after you lock up, go down to the library basement. Make sure to take along a book of your choice. It can be anything. Then, you'll need to sit down there and read aloud for at least half an hour. I blinked as I stared at my mom, giving me a stern look from her hospital bed. Um, am I supposed to record this, or...? No, don't worry about that. Just go down there and read. Mom, there's nothing down there. It was true. The basement was a decrepit dust fest, complete with a bare concrete floor and rows of useless crap that had never been thrown away for some odd reason or another. It doesn't matter if there is or isn't anything down there. You just do as I said. Understand? She was rarely so harsh to me, so I agreed, making a big show of writing it down. She relaxed. Make sure you lock the doors before you leave. Leave one light on, the one by the front desk. If you remember, leave some candy behind too. She must have seen the look I was giving her because she said, I know this all seems like an odd thing to ask, but it's very important to me, all right? I couldn't say I was sure that my mother was completely sane or that she hadn't conked her head hard enough to drive logic out the window. But she was looking at me as though this was the most important part of my job. So I gave a resigned nod and said, All right. The practice, however, was much easier than the theory. Mostly because I really fucking hated going into that basement. The first night I went down, I grabbed my copy of Wuthering Heights, one of my favorite books, and descended the stairs. Flicking on the light as I went. There was only one functioning light in the basement. A bare bulb hung from the ceiling that illuminated a tiny circular spot on the floor. I felt like I was stepping into the spotlight as I sat down in the chair my mother must have placed there. I sat in total silence and cleared my throat. It was strange being down here alone. I really didn't like that. But had a job to do, so I set a timer on my phone for 30 minutes and started reading. I stumbled a bit at the beginning, the words jumbling together on their way out of my mouth, but soon I had found my groove and the narrative flowed just fine. 
my voice carrying throughout the damp basement. It made me nervous, the way I broke the silence. It seemed wrong. I could feel my pulse hammering hard in my throat and I began to wish that I had just ignored my mother's instructions. I'm stupid. This is stupid. And I'm stupid for doing this stupid thing. Stupid. As I kept reading, I gradually became aware of the feeling of somebody watching me. Of course I'd feel that way. I mean, I was sitting in this creepy old basement, all alone, with even barely a light to keep me company. My voice echoing off the cement walls in total solitude. It's completely normal that I'd begin to feel creeped out, as though I wasn't really alone. Normal, but that didn't mean that I liked it. I was startled when my phone roared to life, its jingle signaling the end of my 30 minutes. Swallowing hard, I silenced the offending object and raced up the stairs, suddenly feeling that something was going to slither out and drag me back down if I wasn't careful. I slammed the basement door shut and ran through the library, finishing everything as quickly as I could. I left the light on over the front desk. I bought a candy bar during lunch, the Milky Way, if you're curious, and I left it on the desk. It looked like an offering to something. I couldn't stop shaking. I ran out the front door and locked it, checking and rechecking to make sure that I hadn't made a mistake. I won't lie. I was relieved after locking it, as though the extra barrier between myself and the basement would save me from... something. It took me a full ten minutes before I was calm enough to climb into my car and drive to my parents' house, where my mom and dad had set up my old room for as long as I'd be running the library. Dad was at the hospital with mom, who hadn't come home yet, so I had the house to myself. I got drunk that night prying open my dad's liquor cabinet and drinking whatever I laid my eyes on. I threw on some stupid sitcom and sat in the living room, all the lights on and a blanket drawn around me like a suit of armor. So ended the absolute worst first day of a job I've ever had. That first week was anything but easy. On Tuesday, I made a kid cry during story time. On Wednesday, I caught one of the patrons trying to watch porn on the computer. On Thursday, the town pervert came in specifically to harass me, and I had to threaten the police on him when he started bragging about his massive cock. On Friday, it rained and the roof leaked, ruining about a dozen good books that would have to be replaced. The one thing that got easier, at least, was the basement. At first, I'd been so confused as to why my mother had asked me to do all these strange rituals. It was like she was trying to assuage a spirit or something. The moment that thought occurred to me, I realized what was happening. My mother, you see, is a big believer in ghosts. The library has always had its share of bad luck. Lights going out on their own, computers crashing, etc. She must have started to believe that it had its own little haunting. Perhaps she thought that if she read to it, gave it offerings, things would go smoothly. After that, my nightly rituals became kind of fun. I started to imagine that the ghost my mom had been communicating with was another young woman, just like me. I picked out books that I thought she might like, I said books that I liked, and put more feelings into my readings. Occasionally, I'd find myself talking to her absent-mindedly throughout the day. In the end, I even started believing she might actually be there. It started with the candy. As per my mother's request, I'd buy the elusive little spirit something as an offering. I started out with chocolate, and I'd throw it away in the morning. One night, however, I left a bag of Skittles, and the next morning it was gone. I'd scoured the library looking for some sign of the candy, but it was just... gone. From then on, I started buying all different kinds of treats, seeing if I could get different results. Chocolates were usually left behind, but hard candies were almost always gone by the next day. 
after about three weeks, I decided that, yes, there was a ghost, and I was beginning to understand its preferences. Maybe it seems that I'm being a little bit too cavalier about all this. After all, it's not every day that people decide they're dealing with ghosts and start messing around with them. Of course, you have to remember that I hadn't actually seen any ghosts. I just imagined that they must be there. To me, it was something of a game. I got to play make-believe in some forces that be played along. It was fun, if a little strange. That all changed one night just after closing, when I made the mistake of letting down my guard. Everyone in town knew that the library closed at 8pm on Thursdays, and that day was a Thursday. It was already 8.30 and I was choosing a book. I'd just about decided on Little Woman when I heard the bells above the door jingle and somebody step inside the library. Now, I hadn't locked the door yet because, well, I didn't think I needed to. I can already hear you guys telling me how stupid I am, but cut me a little slack. After all, it's a small town and nothing ever happens in small towns, right? Guess again. I peered out from the bookshelf I was standing near and saw the town pervert walking towards me. He had this big shit-eating grin on his face and immediately I was on high alert. Let me give you a quick rundown on how this guy looks. He's massive. And I don't mean fat. He's ridiculously tall with a fair amount of muscle bulging out of his ill-fitting and stained clothes. He lacked the capacity to understand personal hygiene, apparently, because his hair was always greasy and his breath smelled like the inside of a bat cave. He had a bad habit of getting inside a person's personal space and leering at them, his eyes traveling shamelessly over their body. It disgusted me. My mom had always warned me about this guy. We'll call him Chad, for the sake of anonymity. See, Chad would try to fuck anything that moved regardless of age or circumstance. He'd been around since I was a kid, and he had often tried to convince both me and my older sister to come into his house and talk with him. Just for a moment, he had something nice to give us. He'd gotten kicked out of the library several times in the past for hitting on minors, or on my mother herself. He had wandering hands and no sense of decency. And at that moment, I was alone with him. You still working here for your ma, Cassie? He asked easily, his steps not slowing as he approached me. I took a few instinctive steps back, putting the desk between us as a sort of barrier. Not that he couldn't work his way around that. I wondered if I'd be able to grab my mace from my purse. You know I am, Chad, he snapped, already annoyed with him. You know you're not supposed to be here after hours. You need to leave. Right now. He gave me an easy smile. I just want to talk to you, sweetie. We're friends, aren't we? I felt a heave deep in my stomach at those words. I scanned my work area for my purse, but remembered all too late it wasn't there. Fuck! I left it in the car. No, we're not friends. If you don't leave right now, I'm going to call the cops. Not that calling the cops would do much good. The reason people like Chad could still exist in such a small community was that the cops were absolute shit. Still, I reached for the phone anyway, because I don't make threats that I don't intend to keep. Chad's polite mask slipped off then, so I knew it would. I'd been hoping he was smart enough to hightail it out of there when I made my threat, but my hope was clearly misplaced, especially since there were no witnesses to his behavior. His eyes darkened and he snarled, You fucking bitch. In a moment, he was halfway over the desk and I shrieked. I stumbled backwards, just out of reach as he lumbered towards me, sporting a tent in his pants that told me he enjoyed chasing me into a corner. In an absolute panic, I ran down the stairs to the basement, stumbling and falling the last few steps and sprawling out on the concrete. A deep pain flared up in my arm as I landed on it, and I knew instantly that it was definitely sprained, maybe broken. I could hear Chad pounding down the steps, and I crawled into the darkness, my legs shaking too hard to support myself. 
I had just about made it past the little circle of light. He must have turned it on before he came down, when his hand shot out and caught me by the ankle. He was freakishly strong, although I shouldn't have been surprised given his physique. He clamped his hand down so hard I thought he might actually snap my ankle bone. I screamed again as I tried to pull myself away from him, but my attempts were futile. I heard him panting hard in arousal as he pulled me back. Filthy little slut. Been teasing me all these years. Now look what it's gotten you. He muttered, falling on top of me and pitting me down. I thrashed and yelped as he fumbled with my blouse, cursing its buttons. And then, just then, I got that feeling again. That feeling of being watched. This time it was much stronger than before. I instantly froze, suddenly feeling a great danger surrounding me. A danger other than Chad. The air in the basement seemed to have dropped a good ten degrees and I could see puffs of his rotten breath forming above me. On instinct, I began to strain my eyes, looking past his hulking body into the darkness, even as he undid the last button and reached for my bra. There, in the darkness, something was moving. It was as though the darkness in the room had become liquid, and it was shifting and twisting. My breath caught in my throat and I barely felt Chad's hands on me. I had gone silent when I sensed the disturbance, but now I began to make strange wheezing noises as the liquid darkness moved towards us. Chad didn't ask if I was okay or what was wrong. I don't think he even noticed. He was too busy trying to get me out of my slacks. He never saw it. But I did. It had black fur which was probably why I had never seen it before. His body was absolutely massive, pushed along by four long, spindly legs. It looked something like a spider, but for the way it walked, its body was obviously heavy, because the legs did a little more than drag it forward, its body scraping along on the ground. I noticed that its legs ended in a sharp claw, making each into something of a spear. I couldn't scream. I wanted to, but I couldn't. As I lay there under the body of my would-be rapist, I was dimly aware that he hadn't quite succeeded in declothing me yet. I saw one of its front legs snap forward. It had been lumbering towards us so slowly that I almost thought it was incapable of speed. Apparently I was wrong, because in the time it took me to blink, its leg had managed to spear through Chad's chest poking through the other side and showering me in blood. I gagged. Chad's eyes were wide open, staring at me in utter confusion as though he had thought I was the one who did this. In reality, I was just as surprised as he was, especially when the leg began to split apart into smaller appendages, goring him from the inside out. In absolute horror, I crawled backwards, bumping into some boxes behind me. The creature jagged Chad's still struggling body backwards towards its bulk before extracting its limb. With great effort, it pulled itself upon its legs. Now I could see its belly. Well, what should have been its belly. I watched its fur pull back to reveal several rows of jagged yellow teeth pointed just slightly outwards. Its maw was larger than my torso, and I watched as it lowered itself down on top of Chad. I'm glad that I couldn't see what exactly those teeth did to him. Most of my vision was blocked by the black furry body, but I did manage to see the blood. The amount of red that covered the floor and coated the beast gave me a pretty good idea of what was happening. I seemed to recall that Chad's screams went on a great while longer than I expected them to. Eventually, the thing finished feeding. The sickening crunch of Chad's bones stopped and it settled itself on the floor once more. Its legs began to drag its body forward as it crawled to me. Tears were coursing down my cheeks as I thought about what had happened to Chad. I never really planned out what kind of death I wanted, but I knew that wasn't it. I was shaking so hard the boxes behind me started to rattle as the thing crawled towards me at an agonizingly slow pace. 
It stopped just in front of me. I found myself frantically searching for eyes, but I found none. I had an awful moment where I wondered if it could smell me. And then, something amazing happened. Something amazing and unbelievable. It lifted itself up just a bit and spit out a wrapper. A Skittles wrapper. There was a long moment where neither of us moved. The black creature was waiting for me to do something, and I was waiting to do it. Eventually, I mustered up enough courage to reach forward and pick up the wrapper. As soon as I did, it turned itself around, dragging its heavy body back to the corner where I had been hiding in. I sat there for a long moment, staring alternatively at the wrapper, but then at the mess of blood that the beast had left on the floor, splattered with the occasional eyeball or tooth. I stared and I thought. Eventually, I stood up. I walked on shaking legs up the stairs to the young adult's aisle, plucking little woman from the shelf. I then walked back down to the basement, riding the chair that had been tipped over during my struggle with Chad. I sat down, and, in a surprisingly steady voice, I began to read. It was about two weeks later that my mom was cleared to come back to work. Well, cleared might be a poor term. It's more that she ordered the doctor to give his consent for her to return to work, otherwise she was going to find him and kill him in his sleep. Something to that effect. Hey, the women in my family are scary, what can I say? I decided to stick around for a few more weeks, helping my mom out as she got back to her daily routine. She observed me carefully, probably trying to decide if I knew what she thought I knew. One night, as we were closing, she asked me, Did something happen to Chad? He usually comes in at least once a day, and I haven't seen him at all since I've been back. I shrugged, thinking of the hour I'd spent cleaning up the basement so there would be no trace of the... Incident. Guess I don't know. Maybe he decided to skip town. It does look that way, doesn't it? She said, watching me closely. After a moment of silence, she said, Would you like to read tonight? Or should I? I answered her with a grin that told her everything she needed to know. I think I'll do tonight. I still need to finish Little Woman. My mom smiled at me, knowing that she'd found a fellow conspirator. I know I should go back to my writing, but I'm finding it a bit hard to leave the library now. After all, it's not every day that you meet a new friend.